Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'll tell you later. <laughs> I'm Terry Tazioli. I work here at the University Bookstore, and I work with the events group, uh, which, which organizes things like this. We do, oh gosh, several hundred of these a year. We had, and they, they're from soup to nuts, trust me, but I've done a conversation where there was the author and me and two of our best friends. <laughs> that was it. And then we have events like last night where there were 700 people to hear Cecile Richards and and that didn't even fill up the joint. We've had a few sellouts. Oh, well, thanks, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, buddy. We're and what I have to do in the morning is count the number of empty chairs here and give a report on why you didn't fill up. That's, this is better than I thought. Just, on my beer run, it got better. because my family showed up. <laughs> Thank you, family. You never know. Some nights there's 300 people and some nights there's I know, six. I know. Yeah. It's sad to this yeah, well, you, you didn't have to mention 700, though. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that like four times <laughs> in my life. Well, you know how many we have for Dan You didn't have any choice. What's that? You know how many we have for Dan Rather? I don't want to know. No, <laughs> tell me that. I'm sorry. Tell me how many. Can, can you hear me if I don't yeah. use this? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah I think we're better that way. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to do a couple housekeeping things first. I. Uh, we, the store closes at 8 o'clock. Promise we will not lock you in here. We'll be done before then. Uh, if you would like to buy any of this guy's books, they're all right back there behind you all on this side on the table, including the 10th anniversary edition of All About Lulu. Lulu. All about Lulu. So that's there. Uh, there's a cash register right across the mezzanine. Hi, Grace. That's Grace. She'll take care of you. Just make sure you get them purchased by before 8 o'clock. Uh, and then after we're done, um, you're going to be stamp. over here to sign. Yeah, you're going to be stamping. Come on through. I'll just stamping. Walk you through. There's so, you know, 700 do you, people. Do you have personalized be, stamps? Yeah. You do? Very cool. That's good. Lots of you probably know this gentleman, Jonathan Everson. He. This is your fifth book. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, well, like my 15th, but my fifth Well, there, I wasn't going to bring that up, but go ahead. Yeah, it's my fifth published, and mm -hmm. then I had I had a lot of lot of failures, and I'm still working. I I had more recent failures as well. So I mean, I think the total number of books is 15 or 16. Yeah. Okay, so well, I'm I understand still operating that at a deficit. I, I, I my guess is you do not have any of your bathrooms papered with rejection letters. Not anymore because you burned them or you did something else to them. I did. I burned them. Uh, that was maybe like 15 years ago, and it was funny because. Uh, as soon as I burned them, I actually started like selling the same stories. It's really true. I mean, I, not that I read The Secret or anything, but I mean, it can't be that good of an idea to just surround yourself in your own failures. And once I like released that and I started burning the rejection notices, honestly, like the next, like maybe two weeks passed and like I started selling stories. That's okay. Just like that. Did you bury any of them? I buried three novels, yeah. Okay. You buried the, ma the manuscript? The whole salt of the earth. More okay, I'll keep either. that in mind when I finish my 43rd one that's okay. out in the backyard at the moment. Lawn Boy, Mike Munoz. I like this guy. He's pretty cool. Um, what do you like about him? Um, he reminds me of my nephew. He reminds me of me at 22. Mm -hmm. He's just a, uh, you know, just a working class kid looking for a fair shake, learning how to um, sort of engage the world on his own terms, you know, in spite of capitalism and identity politics and all the outside forces pushing in on around him and the status quo, mm -hmm. trying to make them, uh, you know, trying to shape him into what they want him to be. He's just inventing himself. Yes, he's over and over and over again. It seems in the book where he's trying various things or listening to people encourage him to try something else. But he has, well, I mean, you might say he has two dreams. One is the topiaries. Yeah, yeah, one, he's a topiary, a master of topiary. Mm -hmm. yeah, his uh, his uh, magnum opus was supposed to be a mermaid, but he had one um, really stubborn branch that went right through the middle, and um, so he had to embrace it. And he likes to say that the erection was there, and he just freed it. <laughs> so it ended up being like a merman, and he did like a little, lot of little sucker fish around the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> he also, well, at least he keeps saying as the story goes on, that he's determined to write the great American novel and it's going to be about... Yeah, he says he wants to write the great American landscaping novel. Right, yeah. right. 
<laughs> well, there's a, Mike grows up in the library, much like I did. Got a single mom, four kids. She worked two jobs, and so I, I spent a lot of uh, I spent you know between like you know third grade and eighth grade when I found punk rock, and I just stopped coming home. Basically, I I would just hang out at the library after school for hours and hours and hours, and uh, you know just kind of looking for books about me, not really finding them. You know, that's interesting because I wrote down one of the things I'm watching, just to prove it to you, let me dig this out here, um, if I can find it. Mike goes into the library. Uh, he's in the library, it's early on in the book. He wants a book, he wants grit, he wants realism, and he can't find it. More importantly, he asks, where are the books about me? Where's that come from? I just told you that. I know you did, but talk some more about it. Well, um, Besides, I've had two sips and I'm kind of about to fall over in my Okay, chair. good. I've had two tequilas and three 20 ounce beers. Um, and I'm about to fall asleep. Uh, I have vertigo too, but that's that's a good thing at this point. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I just listen, I, I mean, I don't know what happened to populist fiction in America, basically. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know what happened. The stories all seem to be in the classroom now. So, like, you go back, like, a couple of generations, and you even, you know, like, Hemingway was essentially just a Trustafarian man. He even had the, had the wherewithal and the, the, the sense to go drive an ambulance in somebody else's war, go accrue some experience. And, you know, London went up to the Klondike and Melville and Conrad. These guys went out to sea for years at a time. And, like, just, I, I feel like uh, just this idea of, just accruing experience and then writing about it instead of just like, you know, graduating high school and then getting into a $60,000 MFA program and learning how to distress your sentences or use the prismatic narrative lens or, yeah, I, I don't know, I just feel like the stories aren't there. And so I, I, don't, I don't read very much. I'm really excited whenever I find like working class, you know, Fiction, like like Mike says, he may, he just wants to read a novel by a guy who you know installs heating vents or mm -hmm. works in a, works as a landscaper or like you know it really sort of captures the the sort of mood of, of of you know real people. I mean that's what Dickens did to the Victorian novel for me. That was like my first love was Dickens because really? you know he took this the, the Victorian novel was just like this this form that was all about the landed gentry and their boring love triangles and. You know, Dickens took it to the street and, and, and made the novel into a, a instrument of social change and started writing about child labor and, you know, started to, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know what happened to it. I, I just feel like somebody locked the novel in the, you know, college basement like 30 years ago or something and, and here we are. So, so in, in a bit, in, in a way, is what you're saying a bit of an answer to Mike's question? Where are the books about me? I don't know. You tell me. I can't. I'm having enough tr trouble answering questions. Of they do. Ideas. They do. It very much seems like that. Why this genre? Is it because there isn't a lot of it, or is it because this is who you are and this is what you well, want? I mean, I mean, we're all mowing somebody's lawn one way or another, pretty much, right? Yeah. I mean, we're living in the age where there's more. You know, consolidation of wealth hasn't been this uneven since like, what, the 1860s, maybe. So you know, I mean, 99. Point Eight percent of us are uh, mowing somebody's lawn one way or another, and um, so I, I'm just I'm just interested in stories about you know people doing things. I don't know, is that, is that, you know. So Mike does a lot more than mow lawns. I mean, Mike just sort of it's kind of like uh, the novel's kind of a comic picaresque in a way, but it's kind of like uh, maybe like uh, the Adventures of Augie March too. I mean, it's sort of linear, but just like Mike's journey is just like a journey through the American class system and. You know, originally I always wanted to write about class in America because, you know, my dad kind of worked himself as shortly after my sister died in a freak car accident. My dad moved our whole family up here, got himself a transfer, and then immediately got himself a transfer back to California and just <laughs> left my mom with four kids. And um, where was I going with this? Where did I start this? Sorry, this is not, this is just, where, where did I start? That's okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so I always thought I would handle the class. I mean, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. Yeah. Because he moved us to sort of an affluent community for whatever reason on Bainbridge and sort of left us there, and um, so I kind of grew up like in a in a uh, you know, not everybody had money as the Russells will attest. I mean, there was there was working class families there, but like if you were a working class family on the island, even back then, you kind of felt 
that you, you know there was other people that had a lot more around you or whatever and and especially if you had a single parent and um and so I've been thinking about like I've been sort of class conscious my whole life and uh I always thought I'd read a class novel but I I, I kind of thought I'd take sort of a broader tact like West of Here if anybody's read that book you know I, I thought I'd write more of a multi-generational saga with you know many points of view across time and space and just sort of explore explore the, the, the issue of class that way. But then um, what happened was I was under contract with my publisher for two books and, and, and I decided to throw the second book away. I was supposed to deliver it and I'm like, it wasn't working. I'd been struggling with it for like seven years. I'd written a couple other novels while I was struggling with it. But this one was in the contract, supposed to be the one I was supposed to deliver. And uh, and I just, I just, the center wouldn't hold and I was just done with trying. It just started to feel like a sausage making operation and so I just dragged it into the trash one night. Just It wasn't even that rash. I knew it was the right thing. I just dragged it in the trash, done. But I was terrified to tell my publisher or my agent or any, anybody in my camp or whatever about that. And like I still needed to write because I'm like, look at me, I'm a fucking mess. You know, I'm a biochemical mess that has to you know, yeah. basically self-medicate with alcohol just so I'm manageable. And, and I needed to write because that's why I always did it. That's why I wrote eight books before anybody published me because I need the activity, the focused activity. And so I needed to write something. And so I started this blog called Mike Munoz Saves the World dot net. And uh, uh, it was just about a 22 year old landscaper, um, basically just, you know, rhapsodizing about landscaping and complaining about the vagaries of working for his his boss, Lacey, who's an asshole. And, mm -hmm. and basically just, you know, the dynamic that he works in because he, you know, he lives on the res in Squamish and he drives across the Agapass Bridge for work, which they call the service entrance. And, you know, he's basically working in gated communities and it's the only time he's ever going to be in a gated community. And he's working for people who are, and I had this experience. I, luck, unfortunately, was 35 and not 22. I mean, I, I kind of, I kind of arrived at landscaping myself in my 30s by mm -hmm. default. But, and I had this experience that Mike did, which is like these people would hire me they never remember my name. It didn't matter that I was actually a really skilled trade person. I could, I, I could make their, you know, I could call, uh, you know, I could make their box would look great. My edges were gold. I was Barishnikov with a mower. Man, I was good. I was good. And they didn't look at it as skilled labor, even though their yard looked dynamite when I was done with it. And they always just kind of treated you as just the hired lackey. You know what I mean? It wasn't, you were just a worker. You know what I mean? It, you weren't a tradesperson. You were a worker. And it was like, so I'd always end up like, some old lady having me move boxes around in her garage or drag her garbage up to the thing or try, you know, people trying to get me to wash her car. And, and I finally just walked off of the job one day, as Mike does, when somebody's like, like I'm not fucking cleaning up your St. Bernard shit anymore. There was this like 200 pound St. Bernard, man. I don't even know how he did it, man. He'd like crap in the nasturtiums three feet off the ground. I don't even know how he got up there. But it was just like, there'd be like 40 piles. And you know, I probably wouldn't have quit, but the lawn was shit too, because it was just like big old cedar roots and it was in the shade. And somehow the lawn still grew like eight inches a week. And it was just the most, I love to mow a lawn. You know, anybody who doesn't mow their lawns missing out. It's like one of the great activities on earth. It's just like one of the few activities push that your, offers. Push your power. Uh, push. And now I have a riding mower and that's part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> so like, you know, I mean, it's one of the greatest, I mean, <coughs> There's so much nebulous work to be done in this world, and when you can push a mower, and all you got to do to look for your results is look right behind you, like fuck yeah, I'm golden. <laughs> so I don't remember where I was, but uh, I kind of do. Where? <laughs> tell me. You just remember the. Tr you remember where I start, and help me help bring me back. Well, lawn mowing and and that kind of work is what you did. Oh, right, right. So, yeah, right. so that was that was Mike's experience. And so he would be writing about that dynamic. And then he started to get a little more as the blog went on. And the, lo the blog, I purposely wanted to make it like a really bad 90s website. So it was like monkey shit brown. It was mm -hmm. just this like endless scroll. You're feeling, can I say shit? It's too late now. You've already said it. Yeah, about nine times. Time. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I didn't realize. Well, it doesn't yeah. look like we're on, you know, live TV Hi, or anything here. <laughs> we can fix that. Look. Uh, so you just scroll, 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 and there's like bad 90s HTML, and like little, my buddy Tup, who's back here, is the one that did the website. And he had a little uh, corny, you know, I had to have like, man, can we make it worse? Make it worse, make it worse. <laughs> little corny little lawnmower gifts. And, and so like, I got about 20,000 words into this blog, which is like, you know, a lot of scrolling. And I finally realized that if I wanted to write a novel about class in America, I really didn't, 
I really didn't need to use this wide angle like I did mm -hmm. with West of Here when I was trying to uh, trying to subvert all the tropes of history and try to retell history as an actual history told by everybody instead of just the winners kind of thing. And I realized all I needed was this one irreverent working class voice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That, that, that knew firsthand, because Mike's biracial, I realize I'm not. We'll talk about appropriation in a minute, but before we do, <laughs> my nephew is, you know, my nephew who I raised like a son, both of my nephews are, are biracial, grew up in a, a you know, Spanish-speaking household, but never learned to speak hardly a lick of Spanish because it was a, they were ashamed of it, you know what I mean? So they identify it as white, as Mike does in the book. And so I did have a window into it, so the appropriation police don't have to worry. I'm not going to write a, like a first-person narrative about being a slave or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but like that's what I do. I appropriate. I'm just trying to like inhabit the widest, widest, uh, you know, purview of characters as I can. And I'll let you talk. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I don't have Sorry, to. Sorry, I'm exhausted. I'm, it's what been a long say? day, and I'm tired. <laughs> the whiny people, aren't we? How did you inhabit all the other characters, like his mom? And his brother, who's mentally disabled. Um, well, you know, Nate's kind of based. Nate's Nate's Mike's older brother. He's like, uh, he's his older brother, but the the birth order's kind of been reversed because Mike's been his life lifelong caregiver. And um, Nate was kind of based on. I, I was a caregiver for six years, and it's kind of based mm -hmm. on one kid in particular who was like mm -hmm. this <clears throat> three hundred pound kid with Aspergers, that was like just a terror. I love him. I love him still. I see him in the library still, like every couple of weeks. But uh, he was a terror. I mean, he kicked out the window of my car once. I mean, you had to you had to placate this guy, yeah. and that's how Nate is. Like Mike spends much of his life just sort of placating. Yeah. A lot of the placation involves food, which is why you know Mike kind of feels guilty that his brother's three hundred pounds because he's kind of sort of you know he always just gives in. Like this is how he controls mm -hmm. him, while Mike tries to have his own life kind of thing. So like I don't know, and all the characters like Freddie, who's this. Uh, I'm scaring people with these characters. They're good characters, I no, promise. <laughs> but Freddie is like this. He's like this kind of. He's kind of this like um, big, big belly black dude who's based on a delivery driver I once worked with, named Ben. But Freddie is like, uh, you know, he 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 lays. He's the doorman at the at the bar that tides in where mom, where uh, Mike's mom work, and he like uh, he he lives in this little apartment at first before he starts renting mm -hmm. the shed. He, he lives in this little apartment. This is like tiny, like studio apartment that's got this oversized sectional in it. And he lays down like uh, uh, original uh, yeah. base base compositions to classic porno. He turns the <laughs> turns the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. turns the volume down. He's like, check this out, man. This one got little Laurel <laughs> Annie. And he's like, yeah, check this look that's out. Right. <laughs> okay, so but he's like, I love Freddie because he's like, he looks like a clown on the surface, but he's such a noble character in the long run. And this is what I feel about. So many people like uh, like the critics are always saying like my, my my novel like I have a way with losers or something that's what Janet Maslin said in the New York Times really? she said I have a way oh. with losers people are always call my characters losers and I just don't feel that way at all I just don't I just feel like my people are just human flawed very yeah. flawed people just doing the best that they can can I say me too and heck with her yeah but I think, think that I think about I think about um, Harriet Chance I think about uh, revised fundamentals of caregiving with Ben, right? Was it Ben, Benjamin and, and Trevor? Mm -hmm. That's my memory. I think so. Same? They're, they came from your life. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was a real kid, too, you know. That I was know. When we closed Sundance with that film, it was the closing, when they made it into a movie and it was the closing night film at Sundance, I got to bring Case to that thing and it was awesome, you know. Even though he'd had a pacemaker inserted like two years before I think his doc I couldn't believe the doctors let him fly but I think they just said man he can't miss this you know mm -hmm. Selena Gomez is like sitting on his lap and grinding at the after party I mean he was he was living large I'll say yeah is um is Harriet being made into a film yeah too? that's it uh, it's in development at focus holy cow so the script's what done and they're talking to directors right now what about now. this one uh you know I, I the theatrical rights are being sold, but uh, film-wise, you know, I don't. It's 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 out right now. It just kind of went out like a month ago, and there's some inviting bites. It's interesting to me that like my books always end up being option because I don't feel like I write like cinematic style books. Like I'm not like I'm not gonna wow you with my visual scenery. Maybe a little in West of here or whatever. But I finally realized it's just because I write characters, and that's what makes movies in Hollywood is roles. You know, characters. People want to play these people, and so it's been very fortuitous because. 
It's hard to sell books, man. People be amazed. Like, I mean, you get on New York Times bestseller list, you'd be amazed how few books you actually have to sell in a compressed time to get up there. Yeah, yeah compared to compared to like, you know, you don't do twelve million dollars at the box office in your first weekend, and you're a failure. You know, uh, it, it, it's just it's amazing to me that writers even have the social currency we have anymore. Well, why do you write? I told why do you because I'm seriously. Well, you just sitting here with me, can't you tell? I mean, otherwise, this, this is what you're dealing with. I don't even know what I'm saying. I can't follow my thoughts. I'm just talking, talking, talking. People in the front look like dead know. chickens. Yeah. Like, this lady's like, what the fuck yeah. is he talking about? He skipped like nine transitions. This lady's wiping fucking spit off her face. I mean, when I write, I get to just be my, you know what I mean? I get to be my yeah. best self. I get to be, oh, that sounds stupid. I can't do that now. We can't rewind the tape. You know what I mean? So it's like it, it, it's the it's the it's the a the shedding of the self. There's a lot of self hatred involved. There's a lot of self hatred involved with the you know I, I just like getting getting outside of myself and jumping through some sort of empathic window and really just getting inside another character and trying to accrue like real experience that's otherwise not a part of my you know not accessible to me if it weren't for the life of the mind. I couldn't get there. I can't I can't be I can't be a nine year old you know. Clallam Indian in 1880 or you know I can't you know or whatever choose any of the characters that are outside my range of experience I can't be those people and that's that's where I want to be I want to be in a, I guess I'm an empath so like I'm that guy that sits on the bus and it it could, it could get kind of suffocating at times I can't I can't help it I'm just like I'm looking around the bus and like pretty soon I'm trying to imagine like you know what are their what does their home life look like what what do they do for a job what is their what does their marriage look like what's the worst thing they ever saw what did their childhood look like you know and so that's why I can't go to New York for more than one week a year because I go fucking crazy man I'm walking around it's like having a Ben Vendors film inside your head like everybody's whispering like every like homeless like person with a cardboard sign yelling at a parking meter and I'm like taking it personally and stuff and it just gets to be like so like uh, writing just allows me to just sort of absorb the whole you know range of humanity and just sort of try to try to process it and like of course you're you're stuck processing it through your own feelings and your mm -hmm. own mm -hmm. you know emotional faculties and I feel like emotionally I mean I'm, I'm super immature in most ways but I think emotionally I'm pretty uh, pretty mature but like and then I just sort of you know, okay, you go. Sorry. No, I was just. I, I'm just. I'm just starting. You're starting to look like a. What does your family think of your writing? I don't know. I don't. Uh, you know, I was doing it for so long before anybody read it. I know that. Uh, I called my brother a deadbeat on a radio interview the other day, and he heard it. That didn't turn out too good. I got a little blowback on that. But as a result of the resultant conversation, we're closer than we've been in 10 years. So that worked out good. And I told him, yeah, you are kind of a deadbeat. And but but I didn't tell. That was like the fourth email before I told him. Um, but you know, there's a lot of blowback. There's a lot, you know. I don't. You know, my mom. Thank God, because I when I write about a lot of it, it's like a lot of Mike's. You know, like my mom joining the church and um, you know, kind of as a resource in a way with all these single kids. You know, it's a place for me to smuggle a bunch of free grapes in one of those paper cups and steal sugar packets and stuff like that, and have the married men kind of. Kind of like uh, you know, talk up my mom at the coffee in the basement afterwards and stuff. Like I write about that stuff, and I feel like God, it's so personal. She just kind of fucking hate me for this, mm -hmm. and it's never that. It's like she doesn't even see that, and then she'll be like, "Well, you know, your uncle was Presbyterian. He wasn't, you know. I mean, it's always just some like little detail, and I'm like, Phew. you know, thank God. You know, I mean, she always just gets hung up on some little detail. I'll call somebody a Methodist when they were a Baptist, or you know, I get somebody's age wrong. And thank God it's just that, because I'm like, you know. Well, it seems that after, what, five books that are out there, that shouldn't be a problem for you anymore. Or you shouldn't worry about it that much anymore. I don't worry too much, obviously. You worry about anything. Place. I threw my brother under the bus. I mean, well, there, you know. yeah. <laughs> Was he the first? No. Okay. I threw my I throw my dad under the bus all the time, but he kind of deserves it. He's a great guy. Like, I love my dad. He lives 12 miles away from me. I still kind of hang out with him, but he, I don't have that sort of, like paternal bond with him why would I I mean he left me when I was really young I don't really know him you know what I mean but like he's yeah. kind of a cool old guy when I meet him he speaks a little Greek speaks a little Latin he's really into science he he's a real character he wears like a uh, he's too proud to wear his hearing aid but like he, he wears like a Donald Duck visor with some cardboard duct tape behind the ears <laughs> and he calls them his parabolic oh, reflectors God. he got no problem That's riding great. around like a fucking uh 
you know, he'll ride around like a motorized bike, a motorized three-wheel bike around town with his parabolic reflectors on, won't bat an eye. You know I what I mean? Talk to like, this guy. I have yeah, to go in no, he's, he's, next week. For I mean, he's a great test. guy. I just, you know, I'll throw him under the bus <laughs> as a dad because I'm a dad and I would never, you know, I would never leave my, you know, I would just never leave my kid in that situation. So there you go. You fuck me over, I, I'll make you pay. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of like Mike Munoz, but Mike, I, would Mike do that? He might be nicer than me. I, I think he would be nicer than <laughs> <more. laughs> I, I, re I read something uh, about you. You've been nominated by the American Book Association as, and this happened a few years ago apparently, as most engaging author. Well, there you go. They, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I guess say, most they uh, candid <laughs> author for sure. What? I think that just means candid. I will tell you anything. I will answer honestly. Well, I, I don't, that's what I do. I do honesty as good as I can. Well, Truth in in advertising here, I used to uh, <laughs> I hosted a was co-host of a national book show, author interviews, and and we were on together. Is that why you got fired? The, I get pretty close, <laughs> but I think we did a couple Sorry. books. I think we did. We did. Uh, yeah, no, I was on with you a couple times. I think yeah. we did Harriet. Yeah. And after Harriet, I got booted off the show. Right after Harriet? Not fairly close. Shit, dude, what are you even doing here? You should be mad at me. <laughs> I, I didn't really, did I'm I really? I'm not mad at you, you oh, didn't good. do it. No, oh, okay, no. oh, it's coincidence? It. No. Please tell me it was coincidence. <laughs> uh, Have another beer. The very, sh the very short version is, it's television. New people came in, they changed everything about the program, they did not like me, and they changed me. And then about the same week that they changed me, the sponsors got mad and said, if you do that, we're out of here. And so they took their money and left, and the show went from, you were on the air at like 90% of the United States, from that to zip. So it's my fault or it's not my fault? I just want to be off the hook here. I just want to make sure I didn't get fired. I'm going to go look when I go home and look back at the old shows. I don't think so. What? I, don't think I, dropped when did I knew when I know I'm on TV, I don't drop any F-bombs. I got kids, and I so, know. you know, I, I know yeah. I'm gonna, not that it stops me. Was Mrs. Hanford... Like was Mrs. Hanford in the fourth grade really the reason you Third started grade, writing? Yeah, absolutely. Would you talk? talk well, about you know, you know, like I said, when my dad moved us up here, and then he, he left. He left my mom with these kids, and uh, so I had started. Like I redshirt my kids; they're always the oldest in kindergarten. I wait, to, you know, wait till their fine motors all up to, all up to speed, and then you know, let them be the oldest in class, and that means I get to keep them a year longer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, like my mom was the opposite because she had five kids. She's just like, oh my god, he's you know, he's right on the he's right on the border. Let's just get him out of the house. So you know, I was that four year old in, in kindergarten. But then they, uh, then you know, I, I, I because of my biochemistry. I did pretty good in the early grades. I mean, I was quick and I was focused. Somebody was doing something right. I had some stability at home at that point. Excuse me. I was doing right in the classroom, and so they put me up to a third grade class instead of a second grade class from first grade. So then I was two years younger. Hmm. And so then when my dad moved us up here and everything else, there was all these other external pressures that weren't working out real well for me. Uh, we met with the school, and my mom made the, the decision that, like, I'm going to have him do third grade again just socially. You know, I mean, I think this is a good chance mm -hmm. to kind of reboot and like this way he won't be two years younger. He's already going to be one. So I did third grade again. And I think, um, you know, I'd already had the, 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 the curriculum basically, which was, you know, you know, back then you were learning cursive and we were learning dinosaurs and whatever, whatever the units were. They were pretty standardized. And so I'd already had it. And so I started to become a behavioral problem in school. And that was also because of these other things going on, a certain other deficits at home or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mrs. Hanford just couldn't control me very well because, you know, again, I was like this, too. You know, I was biochemically, um, thank God they didn't give me Ritalin, you know what I mean? Yeah, no kidding. And, and so she just let me sit in the corner all, all, all year long and write. She noticed that I had a, I, I started to kind of escape into writing a little bit, you know. Um, and so, I, it, because I, I discovered that activity, you know, I mean, it was that something that allowed me what I've already described. It allowed me to focus and allowed me to I kind of feel like my best self and really kind of parse out my thoughts in a slower manner than they were just coming at me, which is like, you know, scattershot all the time and still is. 
and um, she made a writer out of me. And in fourth grade, I published a children's story. Seattle Pacific University published my children's <coughs> story. And so it was like my auspicious beginning into publishing and then nothing for 30 years, you know? <laughs> Just like 500 rejections. Well, hey, and, you, know. <laughs> you know, I was telemarketing sunglasses for a while. And, you know, I, I was working in an ice cream stand in my 30s, and I was writing all these books, and I was just doing it because I had learned in third grade, like, this is what I do to manage, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I had to, I started adding beer and weed into the gestalt, you know, maybe 30 years ago. Anything to kind of just get this out of here and just, you know, if I could just take it out, beat it with a mallet mm -hmm. and put it back in, that would be, that would be perfect. Because it's not, there's nothing great going on there, it's just wired very fast, and like, you know, I, I tried to do, like, I, 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 when I was, like, 18 years old, I started free basing cocaine for a while. And that, that experiment lasted, like, thir three weeks or something. Like, it just didn't, it was just like, no, dude, this is not what you need. You need to go very much in the opposite direction. In the direction. opposite direction. Yeah. So, so like, I'm a big ex. Every, everything I do is kind of geared towards just kind of wearing myself out. You know, three kids, five miles a day walking. That helps. That's good. You know. If, if your kids, if any of your kids wanted to be a writer... How would you feel about that? <clears throat> My eight-year-old just finished a, well, I mean, we'll call it a, a, a kid's novel. I mean, it's like 70 pages. And he's like been a total pro through the editorial process, which is the most important. I mean, to me, that's the whole process. And like, I'm so impressed because like, you know, if I, it just seems like an eight-year-old. I want to be done. I want to see my book. I want to see it bound. I want to give it to my friends. But he's like, nope, nope. nope. You know, I mean, we're like our fourth draft now. He's been like such a little pro about it. So, you know, there's hope for a lifetime of poverty for him as well. <laughs> <laughs> At least he knows by now not to go to an MFA program. So I'm also yeah, up there. there. I don't have to pay for his wedding. It's the two girls I'm worried about. <laughs> I, I've got a thousand more, but I'm not going to do it quite yet. Please, um, ask away. We're, let's take about another, I think I can see that clock, another 10 minutes or so. If you'd like to ask questions, have at it. Obviously, I can't answer everything he's asking me, so I need your help. And then I we'll keep we'll getting do a little signing. bit about like an Ivan Doig flashback over here every time. No kidding. You've had it too? Like yes. just out of the corner of my yes. eye, I thought I saw the <laughs> Ivan Doig beloved Northwest Opera. Yes. Out of the corner of my eye, I, I keep seeing this guy and I'm like, oh my God, Ivan's there. Yeah. Still have it. I still look at his Rock books. It, it's wonderful. Embrace it. A great, a <laughs> beloved, a great storyteller. He, he, you know, he was among the many things he was great at sense of place. I just every single thing, pretty much that he wrote, I was there. How important is that? The, uh, it, always important. I mean, I'm big on world building. I mean, for me, like, there's a, there's like a, there's, there's like. I have this sort of idea of these three novels, big novels of place. And the first one is West of Here, and I've read yeah. that. And that's very much a novel of place in, in which, you know, there's, you know, like whatever, there's 50 points of view telling the story. But really what happens in that novel is the Olympic Peninsula, the place, sort of usurps the, the role of protagonist mm -hmm. dramatically in that book. And so then all these ancillary characters, and there's like 70 of them, they start to be, they start to act as what normally a protagonist decisions to because that's protagonist decisions you know complicate his or her journey you know I mean that's the thing that's where the drama comes from their decisions how it complicates their journey trying to get from signpost A you know their reality to signpost B their idealized reality and so that 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 novel was very much about place for me and then I just finished kind of a companion novel which I, I was called Cave Dave for a while and then I calling it uh, Legends of the North Cascades, but it, it's kind of a similar thing, but it takes place in the North Cascades. Mm -hmm. and it's very much about place, and part of it takes place on the Cordillera Ice Sheet in 13,000 BC, and part of it takes place in a cave in, 2000, in, in 2016. And um, But they both have this sort of bifurcated timeline that crosses history. They both have a big magical realist, you know, so, you know, topically they're sort of related. None of the same characters or anything. And then eventually I want to write a third novel. And I guess it's like whatever, it's a Washington trio or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I want to write one that's set in the channeled scablands. I don't know what my apparatus is. I don't know what my story is yet. Mm -hmm. i got to go spend some time over there and let it capture me. But I, I, I very much, Washington is a place for me. It's like, you know, this is the, the place I want to write about. And so in this novel, that's Paul's Bow and Bainbridge Island. Yeah. And um, it's not so much about the actual, you know, geography or geology of the place mm -hmm. so much as it is just culturally mm -hmm. but like world building is a huge thing yeah mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I have a question just in terms of your writing routine when you are writing a novel. Your daily routine, do you write in the morning or all morning or all night or... Well, now that I have three kids, see, it's ever-changing. I used to be kind of a work-a-day, wake up at 5 a.m., work till noon, like six days a week. And now, with the kids, it's just really hard because, you know, focus is hard for me um, because, you know, I'm spinning, spinning, spinning. I'm easily distracted. There's a million things coming at me, and I take them so personally, which is why my best friend Tup over here is kind of my idol because he's like the ultimate absorber. He's got a slower metabolism. He can just take stress so much better than me. He's like really good at helping ground me. Like I just I just spin, 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 mm -hmm. spin. And so I can't I can't just like work two hours here. I need to get inside the character and I need to live. And so thank God I have a, a, a understanding wife because I go out to I go out to the peninsula. We have a place out in Squim and we live on the island. I go out to Squim two and a half days a week by myself. And I work 16 hours, 16 hours, and eight hours. So I work 40 hours in three days. Um, and uh, then the rest of the, the week, you know, I, I have a lot of, I'm grateful for so much baby pushing time because we have a nine month, 10 month old. And, you know, so I spend two hours a day just pushing her on a stroller. So that's nice cogitating time for me. Mm -hmm. I get to daydream the story. I'll send myself texts, reminders, things like that. And the whole, the whole four days before I get out to the cabin by myself is all about, it's more like an athlete approaches it, I think. Like, I'm just all about, like, sort of creating this workflow. Just convincing myself in advance that when I get myself in that time and space, I'm going to be productive, and I'm going to work, and this is where I'm going to start, and I'm going to be in the right frame of mind. And so then by the time I get out there, you know, I, I, hit, I hit the ground running, and I, I'm, just, I'm incredibly productive in those 16 hours. I have to start drinking beer after about eight hours just to keep going. I sit in one chair for eight hours, and I write, and then I move it out to the garage and start drinking beer. And that's when I start working more editorially. Like, uh, I think it was Hemingway said, you know, uh, write drunk, edit sober. I do the opposite. I write sober and edit drunk because my bullshit meter goes so far down. When I, you know, after a few beers, I'm like, ah, that's fucking fake, fake, bullshit, artifice. You know, and so the 2,500 words I wrote maybe whittled down to about 700. So, you know, the last eight hours is kind of masochism in a way. Um, but it whittles it down to this, uh, you know, I do that two and a half days a week and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the pages stack up pretty good. But I'm always kind of living it, you know, whenever I have a spare moment. And, and the odd part about that is, is that, uh, not that anybody asked, I'm just talking, but uh, there's not a lot, I don't have a lot of me time, you know, with three young kids, you don't have a lot of me time. Anybody who had kids knows, you know, I don't shower a lot, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, you know, I don't do, there's not a lot of, I don't, you know, read as much as I would like to you know there was a day when I read three books a week and now I'm lucky to read a book a month you know what I mean and it's usually I'm reading it you know it's it's hard to get there but so so having that that and I don't let anything interrupt with those 40 hours in those three days I just write my butt off the whole time because that's what I need most of all but like I, I still kind of lack the me time and it's hard to explain that to your loved ones sometimes I mean god Lauren so God love her for being so uh, patient with me, but like I think she sort of imagines that I'm just, and in a way she's right because I don't have three kids crawling all over me, but I'm never, I mean, there's not like really five or ten minutes where I'm just sitting there just existing. I mean, I'm just whoosh, mercilessly cracking, cracking the whip on myself. So, yeah, that's how it works now, and that may change too. You know, maybe eventually I'll get back to a different equilibrium. you got to always be ready to change. What else would you like to? Yeah. Um, I remember you from the early 90s and I know about your punk rock days of the 80s. Is that character, that, that time of experience going to come up in a novel at some point? Is that? You know, I thought about it and it's just that it's so lived for me. Like my agent's always after me just to write a memoir about those days. Because, you know, like mm -hmm. I kicked Stoney Gossard from Pearl Jam out of my band. You know, which makes me kind of like a little footnote, like, what are you yeah. thinking? Well, you know, not the best move, maybe, but... Uh, and, like, all my friends ended up being, like, because uh, I was in bands starting when I was 14, 15, you know, touring bands, and I was just a singer. I didn't have any actual musical uh, talent. You know, I could scream with the next guy, and I had a little charisma and a lot of energy or whatever, and I could write some lyrics. But, uh, like, that, what, that part of my life where I learned to do it myself. That was the most empowering 
period of my life, I think until I turned 39 and I was actually sort of entered the literary big stage or whatever, like I was actually, my books were published and it was like, oh my gosh, I, you know, mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I can meet other writers, and I'm not living in a vacuuming anymore. A vacuum anymore. And uh, that period of my life that you mentioned, you know, when I was 14, I started a fanzine. You know, I remember once I spelled Seattle wrong on the cover, and Mark Arm still gives me shit about it. You know, because I'm 14 years old and I'm not the best student, but it's Seattle with one T on the cover, and the magazine is called Simplex One. And uh, I, I would I would make like 200 copies of it at the library. It'd be mm -hmm. like. 10 pages double-sided, but back then they didn't even have a double-sided Xerox, or no. we didn't at the library. Gotta, gotta, so I had to physically, yeah. you know, and I collated them all and I stapled them, I do 200. And the thing that's amazing about it, and I can't even explain it to kids now with social networks, is that I would bring it over to Seattle and I would put it at Time Travelers, which is a comic record skate shop on 2nd Avenue. And I put it out at uh, like Bomb Shelter and Urban Renewal, which is just down the Ave here. This is like, you know, 1982, 1983. And like, even though there's only 200 copies, within a month, that thing would be everywhere, man. I would get letters from freaking Norway, uh, Alaska, Ohio. Like, somehow we made that like little subculture. Mm -hmm. I guess in the early Reagan era, man, we needed that subculture, that, that, that first, first and second wave of hardcore punk rock in, in, in America. We needed it so bad that like, that's the lengths that we go to. A kid could make 200 copies of this thing and it would end up all over the world. And yeah. it was, you know, now I could do that instantaneously and it's really empowering and amazing, you know, to just be able to put something out there and hear from people all over the world. It's so great. But like, it's amazing to me that it worked that way then. Like, mm -hmm. so like so much of that experience that Matthew asked about, like, uh, colors my life, but I don't, I don't really want to write about it partially because there'd be so much social blowback because I mean I'm given to so much hyperbole I'll just tell you if I give you a number if I say there's 300 people there 220 um, <laughs> if I say a book 600 pages long I just finished 480 you know what I mean it's just like this hyperbolic impulse I can't uh, I can't even you know it's like a, it's a I think it goes back to the 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 oral storytelling tradition I tend to mm -hmm. blow things up a little bit and so so when I say 200 copies, it was probably 150. And when I say Norway, it was probably Kingston. Um, no, it wasn't that. No, no, literally. No, literally. I mean, I did get stuff from overseas. But it was, uh, I, I don't know. It just seemed, like, compared to how things are now, it just seems so amazing that, like, that people needed it that bad. You know what I mean? Like, kids needed it that bad that, like, they would go out and find it. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, please. I'm, I'm intrigued by a third grader actually writing anything. What was, what kind of stuff was it like? Bang bang, shoot 'em up, uh, fantasy. I mean, I, I think of my own third grader, and it's just like there's. I'm just, I'm having a hard time imagining that a third grader could string together enough words that you could write a bunch of pages. I distinctly remember starting with place. I was fascinated with places I hadn't been. I remember writing about the Big Apple, and I'd never been to New York, and just writing about it, because I was also the kid that read the Almanac. Remember that? It was oh, a paper yeah. book, you know, book with binding. It had like a thousand pages in it, and I was obsessed with statistics. So, like, you know, I would go to, like, the skyscraper section of, like, the 40 biggest cities in America, and I, I knew how many skyscrapers, over 600 feet they had in their city, and I knew the names of them, and I knew the populations of the city, and I knew all this demographical information, and I knew all the sports, all the sports records and all that. So a lot of it was just writing about information and making it into stories. I would just, which is actually so ironic to me now, because it took me until I was in my late 30s to really realize that telling stories good is really just about managing information for so many bad books you just think it's about you the author and your great voice and edifying the reader and you know what I mean that's all bad writing has that in common it forgets the reader kind of thing and so now I totally view it as information so I can do this dance with the reader I just always in the reader I'm not saying like the the, the 35 to 6 year old female demographic I'm just me on the other side just keeping myself honest and like what have I told the reader? How, I, how can I use, what, how can I withhold information? How, how can I use misdirect? How can I sort of lead the, lead the, lead the dancer on and, and, and not uh, 
and, and, and still undermine their expectation and surprise them and stuff like that. So I view it as all as information, but that's how my original foray into writing was, was like taking this information and like, I would write about the Big Apple and say like, you know, the World Trade Center is 1200, you know, the, you know, the South Tower is this tall, the right tower, and then the population is this, and it's composed of five boroughs. It was all, it was kind of um, just text, really. So but did you have a storyline? Well, eventually, by fourth grade, I evolved to, you know, my, the book that was published was called The King Without a Crown, which was about a king without a crown. But he was a very beloved, <laughs> benevolent king that his people loved, and, like, basically, I think they just, like, collected a bunch of shit off the ground and mm -hmm. glued it onto a thing and gave it to him. And he was like, oh, my God, our lovely kingdom. It's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, like, I still believe in that vision of the world, but, like, that's what it was, you know. So I, I, I don't know. And then I started writing, like, uh, as I got older and more wise-ass and more antisocial, and I started writing more. Like, I remember by the time I was in junior high and high school, I was writing kind of, like, satirical essays. Like, I started washing dishes when I was 12 years old or 11 years old from off the books for my sister who worked in Pioneer Square at a place called John Patrick's. It was on First in Yesler. Um, and later it was changed to Bogart's. But, uh, um... I don't know where I'm going with that. Oh, by then I was starting to write uh, like sort of satirical essays about the people I was working with and things like that and getting really clever and sort of discovering my sense of humor and you know I started reading Kurt Vonnegut and trying to, you know, I don't I didn't write anything good until I was in my mid 20s, I would say. You know, and then I then I didn't know what I was doing, you know, I was just sending send, send, sending, you know, 300 page documents to the well, read 230 page documents to <laughs> the bottom of office buildings ostensibly where they went straight into the garbage can because I wasn't you know following any kind of protocol but some of them were really good good oh. evening shoppers university <laughs> that's not me in 10 minutes. oh yeah yeah time, to, your time to buy your books people now. yeah okay that's a nice way to stop isn't it <laughs> a, couple, a couple things I, the books are there. Feel free to buy them. Grace is over there, and Jonathan's going to sit at this table and sign things or stamp things or whatever you're going to do. Thank you all very much for, for coming. Thank you.